Welcome to Renegade Inc. George Orwell said it was a book that everyone should read. Published in 1914, the ragged trousered philanthropists detailed crushing poverty, squalor and inequality in the UK. Cut to 2020. The sisters Sophie and Scarlett Rickard have rewritten, illustrated and re-released the book. Because sadly, today it's as relevant as it was in the early 1900s. Sophie and Scarlett Rickard, welcome to Renegade Inc. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Your uh, book, your graphic novel, the best-selling graphic novel, The Ragged Trouser Philanthropists, originally written by uh, Robert Tressel, uh, and you've decided to bring the book out now, specifically uh, around this sort of political and economic climate. Um, why is that book uh, so relevant today? Well, it was Scarlett's idea to make a graphic novel adaptation of this book because she could see that it was full of detail um, and it was a great story with some really fabulous ideas, but it's actually a tricky read because it's so dense with detail and in places not terribly cheerful. So it's not um, on a whim that it has come out into this particular political climate. In fact, when we started talking about doing it, we were looking at bringing it into an atmosphere of a socialist revival in the UK and a groundswell of young people who were very excited about a new kind of left wing politics. Um, it takes quite a long time to draw that many pages. And so what's happened is it came out in September to a very different world where there's impending Brexit and a pandemic and a government moving further towards the right, I think. And but there are still those people that are still interested in left leaning politics and the ideas and still interested in having that conversation, not just about what things could be like, but why it isn't so easy to make it happen. And there are interesting parallels in the story that you could apply to what happened last winter in the last election in the UK. Scarlett, what is the story? It sort of clusters the often a sort of uh, spoken of as the first working class novel and it was written by um, a painter and decorator Robert Tressel who um, lived and worked actually in the town of Hastings on the south coast of England as a painter and decorator um, and it's kind of semi-autobiographical about him working with his workmates and the conversations they had and how you know living with um, things like uh, the equivalent of zero hours contracts and you know all the stuff that a lot of people are very familiar with today, but this is set in 1910. It's sort of exploring how the system works and how the system works against working people. Um, and Tressel was using um, his protagonist, or one of the main protagonists, um, Frank Owen, to try and explain how things could be different. And it's very well written because he sets it up so that there's actually arguments um, kind of between Owen and his colleagues at work in their tea break and things, um, looking over the um, problems of the uh, the sort of capitalist system and arguing about it at length <laughs> in the original. And also, th one of the things that's really clever about it is that he um, it's a sort of fly on the wall. It's kind of kitchen sink drama, really. And one of the really clever things about it is that he explains a sort of economic situation in words when they're talking and it tries to explain how the system works and then you see it played out in the people that you've got to know and so you it, it really helps you understand what he's trying to say. It's also referred to as the building workers bible. Um, yes. Has it has the book uh, alleviated uh, some of the sort of guilt that people often who are impoverished often feel because they think it's their fault, when actually what the book's getting at is saying no, it is the system that works against the interests of the workers. It's an interesting question, and yes, it's quite often known as the painter's bible, and the original was passed round on building sites and and fruit with tradesmen. I think in the sixties and seventies a lot that guilt about it's my own fault I'm poor 
I'm not sure how much of that exists. I think what there is is shame. And I think there's a big difference between guilt and shame. I think there is shame in being poor because of the capitalist ideology that suggests that you're just not trying hard enough if you're not making enough money. Whereas this book points out that the reason that you are kept poor is that it suits the capitalist class. The whole system depends on you being kept poor. And this is how and why, and this is what you could do about it. Whether that helps with that feeling of shame that people live with, I don't know. But that feeling of shame is definitely illustrated in the book, particularly in the way the women cope with poverty. Amazing that 1910, uh, this uh, first, the thinking first arose, and in 2020, we're pretty much still here. David Cameron famously said to Jeremy Corbyn at the dispatch box, so oh, I'll tell you what to do, put a suit and tie on and go and do some work. Norman Tebbit famously said, get on your bike. If uh, putting a suit and tie on uh, you know, is akin to somebody saying, just try harder, then we wouldn't have this structural problem when it comes to inequality. Uh, which of the bits in the book, Scarlett, uh, from an animation point of view or from a pictorial point of view, depict that we haven't really moved on from 1910. Oh, so many, so many things like that. Um, people having to pawn their possessions when they're back, basically down to their last few objects that they have to pawn to, to pay the rent. The fact that the rent always has to be paid, whether you're in work or not, whether you have any money or not, that's one thing that always has to be paid. And the landlord is just sitting there benefiting from that when people are, are really struggling um, in fact there's a bit in there where owen says that the rent accounts for a third of the income of a working person and when you say we're still there in 2020 we're not in a sense we've gone back there because um in the sort of the, the Labour government of the 1940s and, and from that point onwards, there was a massive sort of a regeneration of a sort of political thought and, and uh, going much more towards uh, sort of social justice. And now we're losing all of that stuff. And so at one point, people's rent was a lot less than their earnings you know, than a third. And now it's back to being about a third exactly the same as it was in 1910. Um, there's soup kitchens, people having to go and get tickets from the Board of Guardians, which is basically the same as getting, you know, a voucher for a food bank from the DSS. You know, there's all this stuff which is very, very familiar. There's a lot of examples of private ownership of things that should belong to the community. And quite often when Owen is talking, he uses examples bit like Jesus of um, <laughs> <laughs> allegories of the, uh, to, to describe his points and he describes the idea that well you know what's the difference between privatizing water and privatizing air and right. you know one day when there's an air baron that's got all the air and you're gasping for breath and you haven't you can't afford any air to breathe if somebody was to come along with a hammer and chisel and make a hole in the air tank and let it all out you'd be the first to take him down to the police station to report him and I think that's so powerful and just so apt for today. Poverty is not caused by marriage or machinery or overproduction it's not caused by drink or laziness or overpopulation it's caused by the private monopoly the present system. They've monopolised everything possible. They've got the whole earth, the minerals in it, and the streams that water it. The only reason they've not monopolised the daylight and air is that it isn't yet possible. And if it was possible, you'd see people dying for want of air, as thousands now are dying for want of the other necessities of life. So let's just talk about the privatisation of rent a little bit. Insofar as monopoly, the game, the board game, a board game that nobody I don't think ever in the history of has ever left a Monopoly board without a massive family argument. Monopoly is all about, invented by a Quaker woman, all about demonstrating the teachings of Henry George, the economist, when it comes to privatisation of rent and what happens. And guess what? You end up with a 1% uh, and you end up with the 99%. Are we anywhere near with the work that you're doing, getting back to talking about the, uh, let's say, the, the potency of socialising rent. 
I'm not sure that we're getting much closer. I feel like in society now, Britain in general has a real preoccupation with um, property as an investment as opposed to somewhere to live. Right. And I think until we undo that nut, it's going to be very difficult to change things. And I think that uh, reading a graphic novel version of The Ragged Trials of Philanthropists might start to make people make small behaviour changes like you know, supporting small businesses and noticing how the capitalist machine is operating. But I'm not sure it's going to start a social housing revival that we could really do with. But uh, we live in a progressive property owning democracy, no less, where we've associated a democratic right with buying a house, even 10 houses if you're a Tory MP. How, uh, from a pictorial point of view, do you demonstrate these economic ideas uh, so man, woman on the street can pick them up and uh, and really absorb them. There's lots of different ways, actually. But in the book, there's a sequence where Frank Owen's actually talking about landlordism as a, as one of the many causes of poverty. Um, and he's explaining about how people just own land because their parents owned land and their parents' parents <laughs> owned land. And that's just why. And there's no real explanation of why those people should have it when all of us are born onto the earth and all of us should have equal access to all the the sort of necessities of life which come with being born into the earth. So it's quite interesting because, I mean, in the bit about um, landlordism, he says about, you know, these people have basically got this land from fighting with other people or a king's you know given a tract of land to somebody to sh- to shut him up because he's bored with his mistress you know? <laughs> um and so uh visually it's quite good because um you know i, I use little bits of the bayo tapestry and you know a few sort of not diagrams but um when he's talking abstractly i sometimes have used uh, the sort of abstract of the proletariat as being sort of stick men being forced from one place to another the other thing that's possible in the graphic version which i think is really striking is that we see inside people's homes it's really personal you feel like you know the characters really well and you see how bare and scraping by some people are and how rich other people's lives are and it's of course a very simple and wordless way to show the difference between the way people live and I think that's something that equally is applicable now and you see it when you turn telly on. Sophie and Scarlett Rickard, welcome back to Renegade Inc. Uh, your book, The Illustrated uh, Ragged Trouser Philanthropist, uh, is out. And it's our book of the week this week. Uh, pitch to us why we should go out and buy a copy. So The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist is the original socialist novel. It's a brilliant human story about what it's like to be living in poverty and working hard to try and keep your family together and the system that makes you have to live that way. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and Scarlett, tell I've us... I've got to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this would happen. <laughs> Graphic novels, people often think that comic books are for children and although there's nothing um, un- inappropriate for children in this book, it's actually written with adults in mind and it's a really engrossing a filmic way of absorbing a story um, similar to watching a film but you can watch it all in your own time. Congratulations on the book you've done a top job the Ragged Trouser Philanthropist it's our book of the week. I just want to ask you about your working relationship uh, two sisters when did you first start talking about doing this because Sophie you write uh, Scarlett you draw how does that work and, and how does that process sort of unfold? Right from when we were really small children, Scarlett would like to be told what to draw. She used to sort of, she always, always had a pen and paper and was always saying, tell me what to draw. And so 
it's a relationship that kind of started probably before I could hold a pen. (laughs) (laughs) um, We haven't worked together our whole lives. We found each other again, maybe in our thirties and we've made one other graphic novel together called man's best friend, which is about a man who has a, a, an up and down relationship with his dog. And so this is our second graphic novel that we've done together. So the process works something like I make a script which is not unlike a film or TV script. Right. Um, we discovered afterwards that other writer and artist uh, pairings working in comic art work very, very differently. I don't tell Scarlett exactly what to draw in what panel. That's her job. I tell the story and... Right create the dialogue and the pace and the tension in the words and then we would I would hand over the script to Scarlett and she would make a kind of storyboard a rough storyboard you explain from now Scarlett (laughs) yeah I I make a a storyboard on paper with just with a pencil and we we put uh, code letters in for all the speech so that I, I can I set out the panels and what I want to go where And then we sort of code the speech bubbles in. So we kind of generally know what people are going to say on each page. And when we're happy with that, we know how many pages it's likely to run to. Then I start drawing. As we all know, the creative process sometimes has a little bit of tension in it. Uh, Basically, have you uh, ever fallen out throughout this process or are you harmonious sisters all headed in the same direction? We're boringly harmonious, I'm afraid. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> children we bickered like mad and it would have driven I can't believe how bad we were at squabbling when we were children but we just don't I think we got it all out of our system early we don't disagree we it's quite easy for us to uh, defer to each other in each area because I'm words and she's pictures so if there is the dispute we just go with who's in charge of that bit but there were we rarely disagree. I um, like the decision Scarlett makes. So, yeah, and I like the decision Sophie makes. <laughs> I think that um, there's there's often times where I, I I draw like I'm just drawing at the moment um, first few pages of our next book, and uh, I, I started drawing one of the main characters. And I what I do is I, in the modern world is amazing. I I draw it all on the iPad, um, and which means that every day. I can draw a page and send it to Sophie and Sophie and I can have a chat about it and make sure that I'm going in the right direction because uh, where Sophie uh, works out the pace and the styling with the words, I work out the pacing visually. So I'll set out the, the panels and work out what goes in them and try to, you can slow the reader right down or you can build up the tension um, and so Sophie and I sort of collaborate every day. I'll send her a page and then we have a look. And she said the other day that the the character that I'd drawn wasn't quite how she'd thought of her. And she said, you know, th- this this woman is going to be starving later. And I hadn't made her fat enough to be able to take some weight off. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> so there's right. things like that, you know, that, that where we work very much together. And so occasionally Sophie will say, Oh, I, th- I think if you just did that, that would make it more like what I was thinking. What a but lovely having part. said that, she gets Scarlett is location director. She does all the costumes, all the props, all the camera angles. She gets to decide uh, what people are wearing, and so often she draws things that I wasn't expecting, which make that that are great. Like I think you can probably tell when you read our pages that we go out of our way to try and make each other laugh there's all kinds of things going on in the background on some of the pages that definitely weren't in the script (laughs) what a wonderful partnership you also had a a very experienced and deft editor didn't you we had so much help from our editor self-made hero our publisher put us together with david hine who has a lifetime of experience in comics and we would submit each chapter to him Um, as we thought it was finished and he was give us notes and we learned a lot and we definitely are better at making sequential art than we were when we started and that's down to him. And Self-Made Hero, the publisher, uh, I don't mean this the wrong way but are you surprised that they took this book on at this time or do you think it was actually a really good decision specifically with what's going on, uh, not least the raging inequality? Honestly, I, I think that there couldn't have been a better moment for this book to come out. We 
several times thought we'd missed the boat, you know, politically, you know, with, with Labour losing the election and everything that was going on. But actually, I think it's because it's so relevant, it's actually far more important in this political landscape with uh, with covid really highlighting um inequality and you know everything being very polarized it really is the moment for this book i mean the the original book um they say swung or helped swing the 1945 election um because it was passed around building sites and people's places of work and through um trades unions and things and and people sort of got hip to the idea of socialism and it's kind of needs to happen again and so i think a lot of people are hungry for it when people in the past of the original read this and the light bulb went on it's very very difficult for people then to sort of go back to the original uh, bit of thinking, the original state of mind, if you like. Because once you've seen this stuff, it's impossible to unsee it, especially Mm. when it affects you every day. With a graphic novel, you can also uh, uh, appeal to the dyslexics uh, and the neurodiverse, if you like, the people who may have been uh, at school uh, not as academic, didn't thrive, but still know intuitively there's something wrong and they want to understand it. And I also know that you want to get into education and also into prisons and young offenders institutes because an awful lot of people in those uh, organisations are dyslexic, but they're smart. Is that an aim to get it out there so people understand what's really going on? Yeah, there's there's no doubt that the graphic novel version is so much more accessible for people with dyslexia, people with ADHD, people who would never dream of picking up a 255,000 word Edwardian novel that (laughs) might have a look at what is now 23 chapters of sequential art of people having conversations. It's much more accessible for people who wouldn't consider reading an old and difficult book, but they may well consider looking at this one. And the ideas are still there. And the uh, feeling and thought in the original book is still there but it's something that is more available I think to like you say young people but also people who don't consider themselves politically active. Famously the actor Ricky Tomlinson when he was in solitary confinement was uh, thrown uh, the original version of the book by one of the guards. The guard said to him you shouldn't be in here and what he'd done is he'd counted the bricks in his cell for weeks on end and, you know, counted the windows a trillion times. Then he got this book and read it and he claims that it totally and utterly changed his life. Do you think that that uh, would also be the case with the graphic novel for people who are incarcerated at the moment? I think that the ideas are potentially life changing. And I think that um, when that guard said to Ricky Tomlinson, you shouldn't be in here, I think that's probably true for the vast majority of the people who are incarcerated, we have the highest rates of incarceration in Europe in this country, and there isn't a good reason for it. It's not working. Um, And perhaps reading books like this might help those people to realise that they are potentially the victims of a system as opposed to unlucky. Individually, uh, I'm going to ask you this question. Often people ask authors and artists about, you know, explain the book in a sentence. And you say, well, if you could do that, I wouldn't have written the whole book, right? But you must have had like favourite bits. Do you have a bit that really resonates with you, that really touched you? Um, What are those bits? Sophie, start with you. I think I would highlight the women's stories. When people talk about the original, they often talk about this group of men at work talking about politics but that's only half the story. The Ragged Trouser Philanthropists is a book about a community of people who are working hard to stay alive, and that includes the wives and families, and they're very important to the plot. And I think that the part, the plot that really resonates with me is the story of Ruth Easton, who, I mean, I don't want to give any spoilers, I know it's been out for 100 years, but still, um, gets into a bit of bother and has so few options of how to deal with it. And that is something that's probably still quite true now too. The thing that that really resonates with me, there's a whole chapter which is just a two-hander, also including Ruth Easton, actually, it's between Ruth and her husband, William. And all it is is just them in their kitchen 
trying to work out what they owe, how they're going to pay the bills. You know, so so they're going through everything that they've got on tick. You know, she's she's got um, slates with the butcher and the baker and you know the grocer and and Easton's writing them all down, trying to keep tabs on everything. And the baby's sick, and and it's all very familiar. You know, what, I mean, for anybody who's lived in poverty, trying to work out what you can do away with in order to pay for vital things, it's just so difficult when it's down to the last pennies. Um, and at the end of that chapter, Easton's alarm clock breaks and he knows if he doesn't go to work on time in the morning, he'll, he'll lose his job. And then where will they be? And so it's, it's an example of how being poor is more expensive than being rich. It's that, that whole idea of, you know, if you can afford to, to buy a really good pair of boots, they'll last for 50 years. But if you only can buy pound shop boots, then they're not going to last five minutes. And that is the problem, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just for the sake of an alarm clock that that he that his whole family is at risk of becoming homeless or going into the workhouse. Yeah, right. And in today's terms, going down to cash converters or uh, selling drugs or whatever it might be, but because you're pushed to do that, you don't go out and do that because it's a lifestyle choice. I think that COVID has only made those kind of things even more relevant because that question of what is useful work and what is less useful work is a conversation that Owen has in the book. And we have just been through a summer where essential work and what those kinds of trades that are the wages are subsidised by tax credits because they're paid so badly. If that's a Venn diagram, it's basically a circle. You know, all of the healthcare assistants and cleaners and teaching assistants that have been going into work no matter what are some of the lowest paid in our community. And these people are essential and they still aren't recognised properly. Sophie Scarlett Rickard, congratulations. Massive contribution. Wonderful news that the book is selling and selling and selling. It makes a spectacular Christmas present, not just to young socialists and your family, but to everybody else. The old ones as well. And can we just say from all of us here at Renegade Inc, congratulations and thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's been great.